però lei mette il volume perché sono succede un macello ok va bene allora good afternoon can you hear me sì però yes professor ok thank you very much so we can start let me share the screen <coughs> Okay. Okay. So, okay, so let's go on with our topics about uh, nanocomposites. What we have seen last time related to the configuration micro nano. Uh, in uh, ceramic matrix nanocomposites, so having the matrix, for example, at the micro scale and uh, the second phase, for example, particles at the nanoscale, uh, what we have seen related to the increase in the strength of the materials and the expected increase in the fracture toughness of the materials itself can be expected also and has been also verified in the case we do have a ceramic matrix but a metallic that we call it reinforcement and uh, the principle is uh, essentially always the same and uh, you can see here for example a ceramic matrix uh, nanocomposites, which is uh, belonging to the category of micro nano, in which you have an alumina matrix, AL203 here, uh, with 5%, please take note again of this short, these low values, which can be homogeneously dispersed inside the matrix, I say 5% of nickel particles. And you see the alumina uh, average grain size is something higher than 500 nanometer. This is the bar. <clears throat> it is around 800 nanometer, but the nickel particles uh, are among 100 and 300 micrometer. This is a configuration in which we do have nickel nanoparticles inside the grain of alumina and also located uh, at the grain boundaries between two alumina grains. So we have intergranular sites and intragranular uh, sites for the uh, nickel nanoparticles. This is another example on your right, in which the same matrix, alumina, uh, has been modified by adding 10% in weight, in this case, of another metallic phase, and this a metallic element, which is cobalt. And also in this case, you can see that even though there is a sort of preferential distribution at the grain size, but we will have also some nanoparticles inside alumina grains. So uh, having, having this in mind, these are, for example, some results which are referred to the first case, that is alumina nickel nanocomposites, in which 
it is reported depending on the nickel content, the uh, experimented measured values of bending strength, that is essentially tensile resistance measured by a flexural test, and the fracture toughness. And you see that if we are going to start those values uh, of bending strength, which are around 400 megapascal, by adding uh, uh, some point percent uh, between four and five percent of nickel nanoparticles, we can have an increase uh, starting from 400 megapascal up to 500, 520 megapascal in terms of bending strength of the composites. And at the same time, if you look to the <clears throat> right scale, uh, we can expect and we have uh, an increase of fractured toughness, uh, which is uh, starting from four, essentially four, it should be four uh, and three megapascal per square meter, up to, this is the value, something which is uh, around six megapascal per square meter. I mean, the enhancement is not so high, but if you make a very simple calculation in, uh, in percent, uh, with this short, with this small addition of um, nickel-based nanoparticles, the strength increased uh, around 25 to 30%, and toughness can be increased also uh, around 80%. Generally speaking, we should remember that uh, one pre-existing defect when uh, it is uh, inside the grain, uh, cannot have, a, let me say, a, a, a dimension. We call it A, in this case, it is called C, like you see here, which is uh, uh, higher than the crane size. And so uh, what can be uh, expected in this case, and this is also by looking to the fracture surface, is that the, <clears throat> the uh, base materials, uh, even though in, we are not uh, in these examples so with nano grains of alumina, but anyway, is going to have as effect a reduction of the uh, size of the pre existing uh, defect. Uh, and as we can expect for these reasons, uh, the increase uh, in uh, fracture strength when the grain size uh, is small. The decrease in strength, you see here, if we exceed and have a look to the bending strength diagram, if we exceed 5% in volume of nickel, we start to decrease the bending strength this is reported in the graph, in the, in the diagrams. Uh, this is because when the nickel content is higher, the decrease on, uh, in strength uh, is in the, uh, experimental related uh, and validated to a re reduction in the densification uh, of the composites as fabricated. I mean, densification is a little bit more difficult, so we could achieve a final mass density uh, which is lower, and this means that we can expect more defects inside the materials, uh, and this uh, is the reason because of uh, we uh, see uh, a reduction in the bending uh, strength of the material it's itself, and I would say at the same time also due to the higher concentration of pre-existing defect, uh, a reduction in fracture toughness. Uh, Again, as we observed the last time, where when we were putting inside a ceramic matrix, a ceramic particles, also in this case, uh, when we are going to put uh, metallic nanoparticles, uh, we can uh, observe that the fracture mode uh, of the materials, of the composites, uh, changed from the uh, in, uh, intergranular fracture mode to transgranular fracture mode by increasing the nickel uh, content. And uh, together uh, with the previous described effect, 
Also, um, it could be seen in this uh, picture, you see the white dots, the, these white dots are the uh, nickel nanoparticles. Uh, we can have also uh, the mechanism uh, of uh, Craig bridging, which is one of the mechanisms uh, which gives its contribution to the increase of the fracture toughness of the materials itself. Now, uh, we will see in the next examples uh, uh, some combinations uh, of material. Let, let me say in this way, generally speaking, uh, with carbon nanotubes. We have not yet uh, told something about carbon nan nanotubes, even though we mentioned uh, uh, this uh, nan nanotubes uh, in the last time. So I decided to give to you some general description of what are carbon nanotubes. So you know it and you can back the full the little eye, 91, so not many years ago, right? The so called nanotubes, which are represented by this acronym SWNT, sometimes you can find SWCNT, just to say single walled carbon nanotubes. But if you find also SWNT, we are going to refer to carbon nanotubes and multi walled, this is the second family nanotubes, which is uh, described with the acronym MWNT, uh, eventually S for the plural part of the term. And uh, they can be considered, starting by the single volt carbon nanotubes, uh, looking to the uh, conformation and looking to the structure as belonging and that we be clear that we get in the next slide to the so called family of fuller effects. Uh, will the multi carbon to the family of say nanofa? Fuller and three inch one uh, of diamond and the planar one of graphite. Uh, the study of this American scientist, uh, which got also the Nobel Prize for this, uh, evidenced a, a third form of regular arrangement of carbon atoms, as well as we can find, I mean, regular in the three dimensional form or in the planar one of the graphite. Uh, which uh, is called fullerets. Uh, they are essentially, I wrote here roughly, I mean essentially, some spherical cages, you see here, the four, okay, which are formed, which are constituted by uh, uh, an arrangement, which is ordered of hexagonal, you see, it's a sort of ball, okay, hexagonal and pentagonal structures of carbon atoms. And the amount of the polyons present in their relative proportion, I mean, the amount of hexagonal and pentagonal, uh, they define, they determine the shape and the size of the fullerets. So these are fullerets, which were discovered in 1985. And the first one which was discovered was the so-called C60. Uh, which has the, the, the same, uh, I would say, shape uh, of a soccer ball. Soc soccer ball. And so uh, it was named, uh, it is known as buckyball. And this family of compounds took the name, just for your curiosity, of fullerens. So the question is why they, they have been called fullerens. Uh, just to remember a very famous uh, architect, uh, which was, which was uh, Richard Fulder, okay, uh, 
created the so-called geodesic domes, you see here in the picture, which essentially recall uh, the structure of the fuller So this is the uh, very short, now single wall carbon nanotubes. They were uh, produced uh, in the first time in 93. So again, we are in, in the length of scale of developing new materials. This is a very short time up to now. By means of special process uh, technology, uh, uh, which was an electric arc system uh, by using uh, electrodes, which were composed on a single wall uh, uh, nanotube carbon nanotube. It can be described as it, it, here yeah, in this picture. And you see, uh, is a sort of carbon tube, uh, let's say a sort of carbon pipe, which is formed on itself to form a cylinder. And uh, this cylinder is closed at both ends by two hemispherical caps. Uh, so the body of the nanotube, that is the cylinder, uh, is made up only of an hexagonal arrangement of carbon atoms, while the closing structures, the hemispheres, uh, which are a sort of half, one half of one fuller end, one half of the bowl, uh, can be made by hexagonal or pentagonal carbon structures, like essentially normal fuller end. And so uh, for these reasons, uh, uh, they can be considered as a sort of giant, a very big fuller ends. Uh, and uh, for these reasons, they are also called Becky tubes, okay? Uh, in reality, I mean, really, for what we are able to produce, nanotubes uh, have uh, often uh, some defects in terms of uh, uh, older uh, arrangement or imperfection in the geometric structure. For example, also sometimes the presence of uh, pentagonal or heptagonal structures in the walls of the cylinder, not only at the end, in the half fuller ends, which deform the cylinder and which are very important for uh, what are the final properties of this very small object. Why we say that they are very small objects? Because generally speaking, as an average, the diameter of a single wall, carbon nanotubes, is between a minimum value of 0 0.7 nanometers, so very, very small, which corresponds to the double of the interplanar distance of graphite, and a maximum of about 10 nanometers. So we are fully in the range that we have defined as a classification for, let me say, nano materials and nanostructural materials. In the majority of cases, the diameter uh, is something less than two nanometers. So again, this is the whole range in which we can expect this structure. Generally speaking, look into the uh, fabricated car uh, carbon nanotubes uh, in single wall uh, configuration, we are around as diameter uh, uh, around two nanometer or something less. And uh, they have a very high ratio for these reasons between the length and the diameter due to this, this very small um, this very small uh, value of the diameter of the nanotubes, uh, so they can be considered uh, uh, essentially as one-dimensional nanostructures, uh, taking with them a very high uh, volume uh, surface to volume ratio due to the fact uh, that the volume is, uh, is uh, uh, small because the small is the diameter, uh, but the uh, surface is very, very high. And then there are some technicalities uh, which are going to be used to uh, represent uh, by taking into account the geometrical approach, uh, uh, let me say, the uh, defined nanotubes, especially uh, it is defined uh, by using the so-called chiral, chiral vector, uh, which uh, gives to us information about the helicity 
uh, of the single bull carbon nanotubes, uh, you have here just two examples. We do not enter in this geometrical configuration, but it, it's important because uh, it defines, as you see, uh, the geometrical shape, I mean, the, uh, the, the arrangement of the carbon atoms. But going to uh, the other uh, possibilities that do, do we have, that is the multiple wall carbon nanotubes, uh, you see here, very simple, uh, technically speaking or scientifically speaking, because they are made uh, of multiple and concentric single wall carbon, carbon nanotubes. For this way, they are called multi wall. And uh, it can exist the case, these are <coughs> computer generated image, you see here, for which uh, the various walls by uh, through lip to lip interactions uh, can be bonded. Uh, or uh, the case in which these bonds are not uh, existing. Obviously, uh, since we are putting one uh, tube inside another tube, inside eventually another tube and so on, the diameter of uh, uh, multiple carbon nanotubes are usually uh, greater, higher than those of single walled, uh, and they increase, this diameter increase, uh, uh, by increasing the number of the walls. But if you take into account something like two nanometer for the inner tubes, and something which could be, for example, four nanometer for the, uh, uh, the uh, other uh, tubes, uh, we are still, again, inside the nano range, uh, which identify this class of materials. Why they are very interesting for us? Why? Because we remember that when we are talking about mechanical resistance uh, of a, a piece of material, of a component, of an artifact, they are synonymous, this mechanical resistance depends uh, by different factors, by numerous factors, uh, among which uh, very important uh, is the bonding strength, that is the strength of the atom to atom bond. Uh, which are the basis for the materials construction, together with, and uh, just remember uh, on the macroscopic approach, uh, the fracture mechanics, uh, together with the presence or the absence of structural defects in the crystal lattice. These are very important for, uh, aspects which are going to uh, um, affect the mechanical resistance of, of a material and as of a component. Uh, thus, if we are uh, talking about structures like this one or like this one, uh, in which, uh, let me say, defects are not existing, well, uh, in order to break a, a, a defect-free nanotube, it is necessary, it is requested to break all the carbon-carbon covalent bonds that compose it. And since these bonds are the strongest, which are known in nature, it follows that the nanotubes should have a very high mechanical strength. And together with this, remember, we mentioned some lessons ago, that if we are talking not about strength, but about stiffness, I mean, for example, we are talking about the young modulus of the materials, also the young modulus being an intrinsic properties uh, is conditioned by uh, the uh, bonding strength. And thus, again, since the bonds we are talking about for the family of uh, carbon nanotubes are the strongest, we can expect also very high values of the young modules. And then it has been calculated that theoretical young modules of a carbon nanotube can reach up to four terapascal. So very, very high value. And the tensile strength can be achieved up to something which is around 200, not gigapascal, uh, sorry, not megapascal, but 200 gigapascal. And so you remember, the, the, let me say, just to have an idea, huh? if you want to make some comparison, very easy comparison, let's take the category of steel materials, but we can do this comparison also for the other ones. Well, generally speaking, then we have special steels, 
precipitation hardening steels, maraging steels, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, for a common steel, we can expect a, a, a value uh, of uh, tensile strength, uh, which is around 1,000, but 1,000 megapascal. Here we are talking about 220, 200 gigapascal. If we talk about young modulus of a steel, we can expect values as 200 and 210 gigapascal. Here we are talking about 4 terapascal. Obviously, to measure experimentally these kind of properties, uh, there are some difficulties due, the very, due to the very small size uh, of this uh, object. And the first one, the first diff difficulty is to isolate uh, uh, let me say a, a suitable number uh, of nanotubes uh, to be uh, able to uh, subject it to the test that we want to perform. Uh, and then the other difficulties is a, is a not common, let me say, uh, difficulty in the manipulation because we are uh, we have custom manipulate size dimensions. When we go into the nano size dimension, this is not so simple, but uh, uh, this can be done to some extent and many times you can expect instead values which are uh, predicted by computer simulation uh, in order to over Come these difficulties. We want to carry out the characterization of mechanical properties, so I, I'm talking about uh, lab scale, not about computer simulation. Um, for example, modules and resistance, they are measured directly by using a beams which contains uh, a, a huge number of nanotubes uh, to a stretching of a few millimeters. And uh, after fixing these beams, uh, from the ends, uh, uh, one thing which can be done uh, is the measure of the deformation uh, as a function of an applied uh, force, uh, and then with the modeling, uh, we can go back to the materials property. Uh, then this is generally done by using a drop of suspension containing the nanotubes on a membrane. The, the uh, nanotubes can be fused over the pores. Uh, and then some attractive uh, interaction forces, they arise and they can fix uh, these nanotubes to the membranes, that is the substrate, and then we can make the test. We can also obtain the, 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 some response in terms of, of properties of the materials, uh, I mean, again, nanotubes, uh, by using uh, sophisticated um, techniques, techniques on a large scale, uh, as a combination of transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy or atomic force uh, microscopy, uh, which uh, can observe uh, the profile of the cross section of the tubes uh, from which the diameter, length and strains can be uh, determined. Uh, and then uh, in order to uh, mm, to have, in, 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 let me say, direct information on how much of the nanotubes have been broken. Uh, also measurements, uh, for the reasons uh, we will see later, uh, of electrical conductivity uh, is one uh, measure which is used uh, <clears throat> due to the uh, very high performance in terms of electrical conductivity of this kind of uh, materials with respect, let me say, to the uh, conventional, obviously, ceramic materials. Un another important, another very interesting thing uh, for this very small object uh, uh, is that uh, they, not only they, they have uh, a very high resistance when we look to tensile strength of the materials, even though, remember, they are belonging essentially to the class of ceramic materials, but they are free defect ceramic materials. But they also can be very flexible and they can be bent uh, more than one way up to 90 degrees uh, without breaking or being damaged. And this is very interesting for, for uh, an engineering point of view. 
And so that we can say that this very, very high strength that uh, we can expect uh, by nanotubes uh, uh, combined with this uh, very relevant flexibility, 90 uh, degrees, uh, they can be, uh, they are aspects that would make uh, these materials ideal for use, for example, as reinforcing fibers in high performing composite materials replacing, in principle, uh, other types of fibers, reinforcing fibers, the most common one, carbon, ke Kevlar, silicon carbide, <laughs> or glass. And this is the reason because of, because of, you will see in the other examples, many examples of uh, nanostructural materials, uh, which uh, have the nano uh, feature by uh, the use of carbon nanotubes. Uh, however, however, we need to underline this, this very high, really very high potential of this class of materials uh, is still limited by technological problems uh, of fabrication, first of all, in a reliable way of this small object, uh, and on the fibers, on the macro size, if we want to talk about uh, engineering components. And then we do have also problems uh, of dispersion inside the matrix, uh, for example, inside the polymeric based matrix, uh, which is the system uh, more studied uh, in terms of uh, nanocomposites reinforced with uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, and due to, as we will see, the possibility to have some agglomeration, uh, this again, as we have seen for other reasons, but we have already seen in the previous examples where we were talking not about nanotubes, but about essentially nanoparticles. Also in this case, the, the percent volume, uh, uh, which is usually added to the matrix uh, in order to evidence or to have an increase in properties uh, <clears throat> are uh, on the order of some percent, four or five uh, percent, not uh, more apart from some, some special cases. Uh, and, but before going to this, uh, and in order to complete uh, uh, this very, very short panorama of, of the nanotubes, uh, let, let have a look also to other potential application, possible application, uh, specific properties. Uh, this is one application that um, uh, may seem, as I wrote, as a sort of science uh, fiction, is uh, telescopic nanotubes which has been fabricated at, uh, at Berkeley University uh, in order to uh, follow up a research line uh, which was dedicated to the construction of nanomachines. And uh, it has been done and uh, a group of scientists of this university, uh, starting obviously by a multi-volt carbon nanotubes, uh, they fabricated this, this a sort of telescopic tube, making the inner walls, uh, that is the single, if you want, carbon nanotubes inside, uh, go out and back several times. Okay? Uh, a nanotube of this type could be used, for example, as a sort of nano spring or a nano shock absorber uh, in a nanometer size machine. So very, very fascinating, I would say. Other properties uh, which can suggest uh, applications of this kind of materials. Let's have a look to the uh, properties uh, compared to an applied electric fields. Uh, nanotubes can be treated to become very, very sensitive to the presence of a high voltage electric field. And they usually react to these fields by bending up to 90 degrees, as I told you, to return to the original shape as soon as there is an interruption uh, of the electric field, that is when the electric field is uh, removed. And then, and then if we uh, put on the nanotubes as a sort of oscillating electric field, these nanotubes can vibrate, can go up and down. 
and, and controlling, for example, the oscillation frequency, uh, it can be possible to bring them, the number two, to resonance uh, as if they were the strings of a, a sort of nano uh, guitar. And experiments in this sense have shown that each nanotube has its own precise resonance frequency, which depends on length, diameter, and the game morphology. When we, we talk about morphology, we have in mind uh, the arrangement of the carbon atoms uh, in hexagonal, pentagonal, heptagonal structures. The basic, I mean, the theoretical, the, is the hexagonal, okay? Uh, and then uh, these, uh, these uh, properties uh, can be exploited in different nanotechnology applications. Uh, for example, you see the uh, example in the picture for, for the creation of nanobalances uh, in which the vibrating nanotube would act as a spring uh, and also uh, in principle for the construction of electromechanical nanocradles. Obviously, we are at a nanoscale, so if you see the image, this nanobalance, uh, which has been obtained at the Georgia Tech Institute in the, in the United States, uh, has a particle on the ends, which, is, uh, which has a mass very low, in this case, it is 22 fem femtograms. Conductivity, uh, they uh, show uh, conductivity properties which, which depends uh, to, uh, on the geometry, on the geometry of the nanotubes. Uh, and uh, there are some, some uh, arrangement, uh, the armchair which is mentioned here is those which is reported on this slide. You see the first one, okay? So you have also the reference just for curiosity, but the concept is, is that uh, depending on the on the uh, uh, geometry, the arrangement, uh, we can have or we can expect a sort of metallic behavior. Or in, in uh, talking about con in conductivity, okay, uh, or uh, semiconductor behavior. Uh, in, in other cases, is more uh, appropriate. And uh, it, it has also noted that this is very uh, interesting that under certain conditions, uh, uh, electrons uh, can flow, can pass uh, inside the nanotube without heating it. What does it mean? This phenomenon is called ballistic conduction. It means uh, uh, electrical conductive materials with no loss, which is very, very interesting. And so the, these properties make nanotubes very interesting for the development of nanowires or quantum cables, which in principle, and perhaps we have here something in, in this area, could replace silicon in the fields of materials for nanoelectronics, basing on these effects. Uh, anyway, in, in, in any case, this has been proved on a, on a lab scale, it's not, it's not yet, uh, a matter of uh, uh, industrial production uh, because it's still necessary to develop a re reliable uh, techniques for the uh, production of nanotubes again with the different desired shapes but uh, uh, always in the same way I mean in a reliable uh, way. Uh, then the conduction properties can be also varied, can be also modified by uh, adding different elements uh, to the, uh, to the uh, nanotubes, and we say this by doping them, for example, by uh, putting nitrogen or boron atoms into the structure. And uh, uh, among this uh, uh, possibility, uh, the most interesting results in this field uh, was the fabrication of a nanodiode formed by two nanotubes, of which a conductor and semiconductor put together, fused together, which act uh, like a normal diode passing the current in one direction and not in the other. Another possibly, uh, possible application due to this conductivity properties, uh, qualitatively, obviously, uh, we are discussing about, uh, of nanotubes is the uh, use of them as electron guns uh, for the production of ultra high definition plasma displays. Okay. So another, another uh, feature which is uh, interesting uh, is the behavior in terms of gas absorption and capillarity. So you see we are 
not only in the era of structural resistance, uh, when we talk about potential possible use of uh, different forms of nanotubes, but we can have different sectors apart from the structural one, because uh, <clears throat> due to the, this uh, pipe shape, due to this tubular shape, nanotubes can exhibit, uh, can have, can show to us a very strong capillarity properties. And then the large surface to volume, that is the large to surface to weight uh, ratio, make them uh, very, very interesting for gas adsorption. And uh, in, on, in both cases, uh, if we are talking, for example, for a single walled carbon nanotubes, uh, it is necessary, obviously, to open the ends of the tubes uh, to allow liquid capillarity or gas, gas absorption, to enter the nanotubes. And this can be done, for example, if you have a single, we have a single closed, a single walled carbon nanotubes, uh, uh, by oxidation, by an oxidation process uh, with oxygen, carbon monoxide, or oxidizing in chemical agents like, for example, hydrogen nitride or hydrogen uh, sulfide uh, acid. Uh, these adsorbent properties of carbon nanotubes uh, have been studied, uh, for example, in the case of hydrogen absorption, even though the results are not so promising with respect to with other possible solutions. And in particular, uh, particularly for uh, the use in fuel cells, uh, in order to have uh, to solve one of the problems with which, uh, uh, on which the research and development is still active, that is the storage uh, of uh, hydrogen. Uh, then studies in this way have uh, and uh, have not uh, uh, did not give to us, uh, let me say, unique results. Uh, and so uh, there are other solutions uh, for this purpose, I mean, for carbon and nanotubes, but also it's based on this possibility uh, to have some small structures which, when they are open on the end, can entrap liquid or can entrap. Uh, gas. Uh, they can be used due to the chemical, let's say, properties also as chemical sensors. And this is very interesting. Since the conductivity of the nanotubes uh, is uh, highly depending on the atomic structure, as we said before, uh, together with, with uh, uh, chemical doping and environmental condition, conditions, they have been uh, tested as chemical sector, sensors, for example, for molecules like uh, nitrogen dioxide and ammonia at room temperature. Uh, it has been found, for example, that for a semiconductor, so depending on the geometry, on the chirality of, the, of a single wall nanotubes, uh, as opposed to very low value, 200 uh, TDM of nitrogen dioxide, uh, the uh, electrical conductivity can increase by three order of magnitude in very, very short time, few, few seconds. Uh, on the contrary, uh, looking to the behavior in presence of ammonia, uh, concentration of ammonia of uh, 2% uh, can cause a decrease in conductivity of about two order of magnitude. So we are talking uh, in the fourth case of a factor which is 1,000 and in the second case of a factor which is 100. Uh, and so uh, let me say if we can measure this variation in conductivity, we can correlate the variation in conductivity, which is huge, so it can be measured to the concentration of the chemical agent. In these cases, uh, nitrogen dioxide and uh, uh, ammonia. Uh, how they are fabricated, they can be produced mainly using four different techniques, uh, processing technology. Uh, three of them, uh, the, of these techniques, available techniques, they are based on the buffetization of a graphite block, and thus they work at a very high temperature. 
and uh, another one uh, on the decomposition of a gaseous precursor. Uh, and uh, in all these techniques, uh, in any case, uh, we need at the same time uh, the uh, presence of a carbon source, since they are made by carbon atoms, uh, and a metal catalyst, which uh, can uh, catalyze the reaction in order to form the hexagonal structures of the carbon atoms. And uh, let, uh, for what it concerns, the state of the art, the most uh, uh, promising, the most common, I would say, uh, fabrication technology is the use uh, of a chemical bubble de deposition techniques, uh, which means we are in the area uh, of the uh, of the uh, chemical reactions. You perhaps remember the chemical, the CVD techniques, the chemical bubble deposition techniques uh, is based on this principle. We do, we do have uh, some uh, uh, reagent which are in the gases form. Uh, and in this case, uh, we should have uh, uh, gases, starting gas, uh, which contains carbon. Uh, which can react onto a substrate uh, between them, the, the uh, gases form, and uh, they can give as re uh, results of this chemical reaction a solid product plus another, generally speaking, gases phase. These solid products are carbons, okay? And when the catalyst is properly selected, they can arrange themselves in the form uh, suitable to result in the formation of a carbon energy. Uh, so we have a carbon source from the gas phase, which entered the CBD reactor, and uh, the catalyst, which is put on a substrate, is able to allow the formation of carbon nanotubes. So this is uh, the area in which, for the four different techniques, which I have not mentioned, I have just mentioned one, uh, we are talking about decomposition of gases uh, precursor. What is, can happen, what can happen is that this metal catalyst, which is uh, necessary to uh, catalyze the reaction, thus the reaction can happen, can be entrapped inside the carbon nanotubes and uh, so it represents uh, something which is undesired. And uh, uh, usually there is the necessity to uh, go on with a purification uh, process uh, so that we can remove these impurity which are strongly conditioning the final properties of the carbon nanotubes. This to give to you an idea uh, of our carbon nanotubes. Then uh, just give me one minute. Uh, I, I think I mentioned on the last slide, if I remember well, yes. Uh, you, if you see this, uh, uh, I have put on the Google Drive also uh, a, a, a paper which was published on the review aerospace size. Uh, which is potential and perspective implementation of carbon nanotubes on next generation aircraft and space vehicles. So you have also uh, a paper published in the scientific literature in which uh, there is a, a comprehensive uh, description of which are the, let me say, the uh, potential of this kind of materials uh, for the uh, engineering sector, which is uh, interesting us. Thus, thus, let me found, find the right slide. Okay, thus, we can have, and we have uh, experienced uh, <clears throat> nanostructures made, made by ceramic matrix and carbon nanotubes. Uh, for example, alumina, multi walled carbon nanotubes. Uh, there are very special procedure for fabrication on which we will say something. Let's have a look to the results. You see, again, we are talking about, in this case, 10% in volume, which is a high, a huge number for this kind of materials. But uh, anyway, 
uh, in this case, uh, we have experienced uh, the fabrication has led to these results uh, an increase uh, of fracture toughness of the materials, which materials, the, al the alumina materials, the base materials, by adding uh, multiple carbon uh, nanotubes uh, of about 25%. Uh, uh, so from uh, starting from something which is around three and going to something which is around 4.2 megapascal per square uh, meter. Uh, you see here, this is a cross check section of the fabricated materials. Uh, the white arrows and these white uh, filaments are, are the nanotubes which have been inserted inside the micro, again, this is a micro alumina matrix, not a nano alumina matrix. And you see here in the second slide, in the second picture, the one which is uh, denoted by the letter C, that uh, in this case, uh, uh, we have here, where there is the black arrow, some areas with a high concentration uh, uh, of filaments, so with a high concentration uh, of uh, nanotubes, a sort of a, a bundle uh, which uh, is not favorable because it represents a sort of dishomogeneity in terms of materials distribution inside the alumina grain. And this has been obtained uh, with 10% in volume of carbon nanotubes, uh, uh, even though the phenomena was not so expanded, uh, but this tells to us as the distribution problems uh, represent a limit in order to go on with a volume fraction, to, uh, I mean, uh, in order to use volume fraction of carbon nanotubes with, uh, which exceed the some point of five, six, seven percent, because we are not still able to homogeneously distribute uh, the filaments, the nanotubes inside the matrix, and this means that we do not have uh, the expected improvement, or at least uh, we will have uh, a non-homogeneous materials behavior. Uh, another important consequence, uh, which must be, must be taken into account, which limit, uh, together with the nanotubes agglomeration, uh, the uh, maximum value of percental volume, which is practically uh, nowadays uh, used, is that they affect, they affect the sintering uh, phenomena. You remember, we are talking about ceramic in this case, again, ceramic uh, uh, matrix composites, so they cannot be fabricated by uh, casting, they cannot be fabricated by uh, plastic deformation, but they must be fabricated, as you remember, by uh, sintering, which is a solid state fabrication technology. And thus, sintering, starting from powders, uh, which have been uh, uh, alloyed uh, with the nanotubes uh, uh, must proceed by applying uh, temperature and pressure and must recover all the voids in order to have a compact final shape. And what it, it has been uh, observed uh, that if, generally speaking, we can obtain uh, for pure alumina, uh, let me say, uh, um, a real density, which are very close to the uh, to the uh, theoretical density, for example, 95.7 percent. That this means very very uh, residual pore uh, pores uh, present inside the materials. Uh, when we uh, increase uh, the content of carbon nanotubes, uh, uh, we can have, you see here, a diminution of the of the uh, relative density of the of the sintered doped alumina. I mean, doped. I'm, uh, I'm telling with carbon nanotubes inside. Uh, which do not make uh, us so happy because uh, they, this means that there are defects which are uh, more present inside uh, the material. But, but so a sort of balancing of, of positive and negative phenomena, but the use uh, of carbon nanotubes, even though even though they can affect negatively density of, of the final density of the materials, uh, can be positive, can be positive, and it has been evidenced 
uh, for example, uh, for what it concerns the green size, uh, uh, because of uh, if they are located at the green boundaries, they can activate the green boundary pinning that we discussed the last time. And since this fabrication technology that is sintering, they are based at high pressure on temperature. In this fabrication technology, we can expect a group of the green size. And the pinning effect that carbon nanotubes uh, can exploit uh, during fabrication uh, can leave, let me say, the grain size to a lower value, thus uh, operating as a counterpart for the negative effect, which is related to the fact that the final density is lower. And so we see, for example, that. Also, in this case, with the use of CNT, uh, looking to the uh, fracture uh, uh, surface incision from intergranular fracture, which is usually for monolithic, that is without nanotubes, alumina, to transgranular fracture in the nanocomposites. You look to the uh, picture B and C, as we discussed at the last time, with other solutions. And then we can have also another interesting effect, which explained to us uh, one of the contribution uh, which can uh, give example uh, in A and B. Here you have the gray part, uh, the black gray part, which is the alumina gray. If you go uh, in, through two alumina grains, you see here there is a sort of filament. This is the carbon nanotubes, uh, which is able to activate uh, crack bridging phenomena. And these crack bridging phenomena, which are going to be developed at grain boundaries, contrast or better make more difficult crack propagation and this results in an increase of fracture toughness of the material itself. Obviously, if the quantity, if the volume of carbon nanotubes inserted would have no, would have no effect on reduction of, of uh, uh, final density, uh, but uh, uh, would have only effect uh, on crack bridging at the grain boundaries, we could expect a very higher uh, increase in terms of mechanical properties, in terms of mechanical of fracture toughness values of the materials. But this is not yet the case. Anyway, anyway, positive results uh, have been uh, evidenced. And do not uh, uh, focus your attention only on the absolute value. I mean, uh, you could say, well, uh, we must do all this in order to have a 25% of increase in fracture toughness, passing from 3 to 4 point something. Well, this is a relevant increase for this class of materials uh, because they are brittle materials. We are talking about ceramics uh, and those, and thus this effect, uh, which can be improved, more studies are needed, uh, are uh, very interesting from an engineering, I would say, from a technological point of view. Uh, here a table, just to, to give to you an idea, you see here uh, that the quantity of uh, uh, nanotubes which is used uh, must be balanced also uh, related to this negative effect that they have on the final density of the materials. Thus, for example, uh, look here, uh, relative density, where it is written relative density, which is the third column of the table, you see that we have 99.6, I wrote before 99.7, okay, that's the same for monolithic alumina, and we uh, still not modified so much this final density to 95.1 if you use 2% in weight of uh, multiple carbon nanotubes, uh, but we are uh, de decreasing in a significant way way if we pass from 2% to 5% uh, in weight of carbon nanotubes, because we get 96.2% uh, of relative density. Uh, the grain size, look to the other column, is uh, essentially decreasing when we increase the amount 
of uh, carbon nanotubes due to the pinning effect that we discussed before. But if you look to the fracture toughness, for example, and then you look to the fracture strength, the fracture toughness is here where you, the, the, the arrow of my mouse is pointed. You see that we have uh, 6.8, in this case, megawaska per square meter for this combination, starting from 3.5 of the base materials. And this value is going to be decreased uh, uh, when we increase uh, from 2 to 5 percent the quantity of carbon nanotube tubes, uh, as well as also a decrease. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the final value are lower than the monolithic alumina uh, we have uh, in terms of factorial strength. So the, 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 the quantity uh, of the amount uh, in weight or in volume uh, of this dispersed nanophase uh, uh, is limited due to the agglomeration problem that is the homogeneous dispersion and also in this case this for this class of class of materials ceramic reinforced uh, with carbon nanotubes because of uh, difficulties in sintering and so uh, if we put a lot uh, of carbon nanotubes uh, we could expect uh, in principle uh, higher benefits but this is not the case because reduction in uh, uh, relative density, final density of the, of the materials uh, gives inside the materials a high defects concentrations, pores concentration, and so we lose the benefits uh, related to the use of nanotubes. Uh, here you have some other pictures in which again you can see the transition of the fracture toughness but, uh, of the fracture surface. But I want to remember one thing to you in order to give to you the sensitivity on how these uh, small numbers uh, uh, are mm, significant in any case, apart from the figures you have seen in terms of uh, variation, for example, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, fracture toughness. If you remember when we have uh, studied, when we studied the uh, conventional composite materials, hmm, in that case, it was the case of long fiber reinforced uh, the composite materials. And I'm talking about conventional that is in the micro range, not non range. Uh, if you remember, we were able, well, with a very simple model, to have an estimation of the expected strength in terms of tensile strength of the composites by using the so called rule of mixture. That is by using the uh, mechanical properties of the matrix, by using the mechanical properties of the reinforcement that we called, because that one was the case, fibers, uh, and, and by making a sort of, of, uh, a, a, of weighted average by using the per percentual volume of the fiber. Well, if you remember, we define at that time two important values of volumes. Uh, uh, in the case of a, of a ductile uh, ma uh, matrix and a brittle uh, reinforcement. They were the so-called minimum uh, volume fraction of fiber and critical volume fraction of fiber. And if you remember, what is most interesting for us, what uh, in this case uh, is the critical volume. This critical volume could be calculated, can be calculated with a simple uh, elastic, uh, linear elastic approach uh, and give us uh, a figures, gives us a number, which is more or less uh, around uh, 15% that, well, it depends on the materials that we are going to use, but just to have an idea, is around 15%. So in the case uh, of uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, composite materials, we are always in a situation in which the percent volume uh, of the reinforcement is higher than 15%, 15, 1, 5, okay? Because what, what, what does it mean, uh, the critical volume? The critical volume uh, was the volume of the reinforcement under which we get not the reinforcement of the matrix. If we are going to use 
in a conventional composite materials, a percent volume of fibers which with values lower than the critical volume, the mechanical resistance of the composites is lower than uh, of the, uh, the value of the matrix considered alone. And so it makes no sense to put fibers inside. And we are talking, in case of conventional, of critical values of about 15%, uh, one five. You see here that if we increase, if we put inside our alumina, uh, 2%, uh, apart from the problems which arise, we have discussed from 5%, we do have an increase instead uh, of the uh, mechanical mechanical resistance of the fabricated nanocomposites material. So this is a big difference, conceptually speaking, with respect to the conventional one. Uh, this case that I showed to you here, uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, is referred to multi-wall carbon nanotubes. There are examples also of uh, alumina reinforced, sorry, uh, uh, with single wall carbon nanotubes. And in, in this case, uh, agglomeration and roping uh, becomes uh, more relevant with respect, uh, with respect uh, to, the, to the other case if we are uh, um, working with the same percent of uh, nanotubes, because with a multi wall we have one nanotubes inside another one. Here we do have only single wall between uh, does. Or in this case, or the limitation on the percent volume which can be used without uh, agglomeration uh, is more uh, effective uh, with respect to the previous case. But anyway, also in this case, so do, do not let me say, um, do not uh, surprise if you uh, have again some percent. Uh, terms of dispersed phase. Also in this case, uh, you have some data here uh, with a special fabrication technique, uh, which is a so-called spark plasma sintering, but anyway, it's, it's always sintering, it's, it's a special sintering technology. Uh, also in this case, uh, we can observe, we can observe the two phenomena that we have observed in the case of multi-wall carbon nanotubes, that is, we can, uh, we can uh, retain uh, a matrix alumina, a matrix grain size which is lower than those obtained uh, in pure alumina with conventional sintering uh, techniques uh, because of the pinning effect of the single wall nanotubes when they are at the grain boundaries. And we can, uh, we can expect uh, so uh, an increase in fracture toughness also in this case uh, because of the uh, crack bridging uh, phenomena uh, which can happen also uh, in the case we use a single uh, wall carbon tubes instead of multi or multi wall. And if you look here to this combination, this combination with these techniques, which is different from the previous one, okay? Uh, and so uh, final results depends also on the fabrication techniques that we use. This is a, a must for ceramic-based materials, but in this case, uh, with something which is around 6% in volume <coughs> of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, we can experience values of fracture toughness, uh, which are around eight megapascal per square, uh, square meter, starting from uh, the, the, the same value, which is 3 point something megapascal per square meter. So it is more than doubling the value of fracture toughness, which makes these results very, very interesting. Now, let's move uh, to the other matrix, uh, which is the matrix uh, uh, based on the use of polymer. And if I should say, uh, the classes of uh, uh, polymer-based nanocomposites are those which have been more studied. This is also for the sake of, uh, and uh, which show uh, properties, uh, as we will see later on, which uh, are very interesting from a technological point of view, from an engineering point of view, because uh, 
they are not only confined uh, to the uh, fabrication of materials having higher mechanical resistance properties, uh, but they can also uh, give some functional effects which open the possibility of use these nanocomposites uh, not only for structural components but also for functional components or functional application. Taking and remembering that if we have the polymeric matrix, uh, in this case, we cannot at all think or uh, foresee any high temperature application because polymer degradation phenomena does not allow to us to use uh, these materials at high, uh, at high temperature in terms of structural uh, components. Again, why? Uh, the, the interest in this class of materials because we can have, we can also have uh, the possibility to use reinforcement uh, which different morphologies nanoparticles nanowires again nanotubes also in this case layered materials uh, but in in this case uh, one interesting thing say, is that uh, uh, we can have uh, the possibility to uh, work with a sort of chemical functionalization of the nano phase, generally speaking, uh, which make uh, this nano phase able uh, to be uh, more, uh, more near uh, the polymeric matrix uh, for example, by allowing the development of some chemical reaction which are able to develop uh, interfaces which are stronger. So we can make some chemical functionalization in the case of polymer nanocomposites, which usually do not give results in the case we have mechanic, we have ceramic or metallic uh, matrix uh, uh, nanocomposites. And uh, uh, again, also in this case, look to the last sentence, apart from the definition, we do have the limitation, the limitation which is uh, again some point percent in volume. And here I want to be more clear since most of the fabrication technologies, it's not the only one, eh? but most of the fabrication technology of these materials can be start from liquids eh? in which uh, solid reinforcement phase is uh, previously dispersed because uh, uh, this one to five percent is the limit nowadays uh, for which during processing, as it is shown in this, uh, in this uh, uh, simple slide, we can have together, because we need all these things together, a good distribution and a good dispersion in order to fabricate uh, materials uh, which have the same properties in, in each point. Because we can have, we could have in principle a good distribution. You see, A, it's a good distribution because uh, in all the parts of the materials there are uh, the, the, the nanoparticles, but the dispersion is not very good because we have agglomeration and so on for, for the other one. So this value, which is reported here, one to five percent in volume, represent actually with the existing fabrication technology, I mean the limit value uh, for which we can achieve but during fabrication good distribution and good dispersion which are mandatory for us in order to have the, the possibility to fabricate the homogeneous materials. And which are the fabrication technologies which are used for polymer-based nanocomposites? They are essentially uh, uh, three. The first one is the so-called in-situ polymerization. The second one is the solution processing. And the third one is the melt processing. What is solution processing? Solution processing essentially uh, uh, is a, a process in which nanoparticles or nanotubes, like it is written in these uh, slides, uh, are mixed, mixed with a polymer solution, solution is the solution, chemically speaking, which is prepared, this solution, by dissolving uh, the base polymer, what I mean for base, the matrix polymer, into a suitable solvent. 
then by using magnetic steering or high shear steering or sonication, the dispersion, the nanophase inside this solution is uh, achieved. And then the solution is uh, poured in a casting mold just to allow uh, by temperature to the solvent to evaporate. And the results uh, is a cast film or a sheet in case we use scar banana tubes, uh, which are most com very common in nanocomposites. So this is the reason because of they are uh, recalled. So I was telling, uh, we have a cast film of a sheet uh, of uh, uh, reinforced polymer. Uh, due to the difficulty of dispersion, in order to get good dispersion and homogeneity, the uh, amount in volume is in the range we have set. Uh, and this is one fabrication, one fabrication technology, which is not very is interesting from a scientific point of view, but it is not very interesting, let me say, for us. Why? Because uh, usually it is suitable to fabricate a uh, uh, small sample size, so we cannot deal with real engineering components. And the second uh, reason is related uh, to the fact that uh, not all the polymers can be uh, uh, able to give a solution. Uh, there are uh, polymers, interesting po polymers, uh, uh, that are insoluble. Uh, in, uh, so we cannot use solution processing. In these cases, which are, um, let me say, uh, studied, uh, been studied a lot, uh, we can use the mild processing technology. Uh, which is, uh, obviously, you could understand that this uh, sentence, uh, as I wrote, is particularly useful for dealing with thermoplastic polymers. Why? Because if we remember our classification uh, of uh, polymers, uh, the two big, not the only one, because there is also the elastomeric materials uh, class, but the two big are the thermoplastic and the thermosetting. The thermoplastic, they do have a melting temperature. The thermosetting, they do not have a melting temperature. So we are talking about melt uh, processing technology. And, and so you must not be surprised if I write that, that this technology is particularly useful for dealing with thermoplastic polymers. Uh, we, uh, we can process also amorphous polymers. Uh, uh, or that's dependent on the, on the TG, on the glass transition temperature, same crystalline uh, polymers. Uh, and the advantage of this technique uh, is uh, the simplicity, okay? It's really the simplicity. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we have the polymer, which is in the form of pellets. Uh, it is melted to form a viscous liquid, since it can be done, so we give temperature. Uh, and then uh, the second phase, the carbon nanotubes or the other phases, nanophases uh, with the uh, melted polymers, for example, by shear mixing or, for example, by extrusion. Okay? Uh, and that, which can have also, let me say, uh, engineering uh, size uh, by uh, te techniques which are very well known for uh, in the area of polymer fabrication, uh, so, uh, uh, such as, for example, compression molding uh, or injection molding. That means that the fused polymer is injected into a dye having the form that we want to realize or extrusion, which is used also for metallic uh, alloys. Uh, the quantity, the type uh, uh, and of the nanophases obviously uh, strictly uh, affect the processing parameter. So we cannot think to translate a standard, let me say, extrusion or injection molding techniques for the base polymer in the case in which this polymer is mixed 
uh, with the uh, uh, nano uh, reinforcement phase. So uh, suitable and uh, dedicated studies uh, have been done and must be done, taking again and always into account the limitation that uh, I want to underline another time, which is one to five percent in volume for the reasons that we have said. The last one, and then for today, I think I think we can uh, stop uh, the fabrication technology. That and next time we, we will see uh, examples and expect that benefits uh, is the incitation dispersing the nano phase again. Here it is reported because is the most common phase, the nanotubes, into the monomer. Then we uh, act uh, for the polymerization of the monomers. You remember, when we talk about polymers, uh, we do have macromolecules. And then we have said, and I repeat again uh, another time, that if the, the bonds inside the macromolecules are strong bonds, they are essentially covalent, the bonds uh, betwe uh, between two macromolecules, uh, if they are strong, we will have uh, as covalent with uh, the thermosetting polymers. If they are weak, we will have, uh, sorry, uh, yes, the thermoplastic polymers. But we start from monomers that are cell units, elemental cell units. For example, for linear polymers, by breaking uh, a double bond, carbon carbon, uh, these polymers can open. And if it opens, can have a link with the other one and with the other one besides, so forming the macromolecules. Well, this technology, this kind of fabrication techniques, uh, starts by dispersing uh, the nanophase uh, in the monomer, so in the block uh, elementor uh, unit, and then uh, these, uh, these modified monomers are used for the uh, polymerization uh, process. Uh, in this case, for example, in this area, uh, this is a technique which has been used with a, with a very important uh, thermal uh, setting materials for your application for the aerospace fields, uh, uh, which are the epoxy-based nanocomposites. We cannot, uh, uh, the, the epoxy-based nanocomposites, we cannot think to have an, a, a fabricated bulk of epoxy materials then melt it and put it uh, put inside the nanophase because that one is a thermosetting. So the solution is to start from the monomers, modify the monomers with the nanophases uh, and then make the polymerization. Because remember, uh, and with this uh, uh, we will uh, see then next uh, Friday, that the monomers, uh, the elementary unit is, is not uh, uh, thermoplastic and neither thermosetting is the monomer. Then when the monomer reacts uh, among them as final result, and this is the classification of the polymer, the polymer, we can have a thermoplastic or we can have a thermosetting materials depending on the type of bond uh, between the macromolecules. This means, this means that we can have monomers in a liquid state because monomers are not thermoplastic, monomers are not thermosetting uh, materials, they are monomers. And thus, uh, if we disperse uh, the uh, nanophase in the liquid monomers, and then we uh, are going to uh, allow the polymerization, we can have also the case, as in this case, uh, that I mentioned to you, and that we showed to you some results of epoxy, matrix nanocomposites, remember that epoxy resins, epoxy polymers are thermosetic polymers, okay? Uh, with the properties, uh, we will start uh, uh, the lecture next Friday, okay? Uh, excuse me, Professor, uh, yeah. I cannot find this file in the um, uh, file that you shared with us. Uh, I I, well, you have in the Google Drive uh, this lecture that is divided into three or four files. It's called uh, Nano Composites 1, 2, 3, and I now remember it's 4. So have a look to all. Okay, thank you. Okay, and, and you will have it. Yeah, I have used for our lecture uh, only one file.
but I have divided the materials for you on the Google Drive into three or four, I don't, I don't remember, subject, subsections, okay? Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, okay, any other question? Okay, if no other questions, uh, we will meet again next Friday. Have a good afternoon. Goodbye, Professor. Arrivederci.